do you picture when you think of global poverty? For me, growing up in the 70s and 80s, it was images of the famine in Ethiopia that were seared into my memory. More than 30 years later, a lot has changed. So what if we could end global poverty altogether? With the trends we're seeing, I believe it's possible. Let's take a look at what's happened since 1990. Around the world, poverty has been cut in half. Most of those gains have come from China, which has lifted over 500 million people out of poverty. At the same time, poverty has slightly increased in sub-Saharan Africa. More and more, the global poor are moving into cities. Whereas it used to be that developing countries were predominantly rural, today, almost half live in urban areas. Poverty has declined significantly in more stable countries. What remains is more and more concentrated in fragile states. Education has improved, with twice as many boys and three times as many girls now going to college. People are gaining access to clean water, electricity, and sanitation at a slow but steady pace. In the meantime, adoption of mobile phones has skyrocketed. Today, more people have access to a mobile phone than a toilet. In many ways, things have gotten better, and yet there are still almost a billion people living on under $2 a day. That means they're grasping to meet even their most basic needs, whether they be struggling to survive in an overcrowded slum, or grappling with the ravages of climate change, or fleeing conflict in Syria. The way that we fund our efforts to end global poverty has changed too. Whereas it used to be that governments and charities in rich countries provided most of the funding to build schools, improve health, and increase livelihoods in poor countries, today, private investment has blossomed and represents 10 times as much. On top of that, low-income countries are increasingly investing in their own growth, with their local tax revenues increasing eightfold since 1990. When you add all this up, this means that aid and charity represent only about 2% of spending in developing countries. 2%. Aid is still important, but it's no longer dominant. So, what does all this mean? Lifting a billion people out of poverty can seem so daunting. It'd be easy just to throw up our hands and give up. But I believe, given these trends we're seeing in demographics and funding, we have a huge opportunity to reach more people faster, something that wasn't possible 30 years ago. That's how I ended up joining the Global Development Lab at USAID, where we're looking to do just that. Five years ago, I was an engineering director at Google. After leading the mobile team to build popular products like Google Maps, Gmail, and Search for mobile phones, I was looking to do something more meaningful. I ended up switching jobs to lead a new group focused on emerging markets. As a result, I got the opportunity to join a State Department delegation to Liberia and Sierra Leone, two of the poorest countries in the world. There, I saw firsthand how difficult life was with few doctors, poor schools, and no internet access to speak of. I also saw a lot of aid and charity programs, each doing crucial work, but most of them only reaching a fraction of those in need. In global development, we tend to think of our programs in terms of tens or hundreds of thousands of people reached. While my experience in Silicon Valley, my success was defined in terms of reaching tens or hundreds of millions, we need that kind of scale if we're going to end global poverty. To do so, we need to play by a new set of rules. Let me suggest three. Be catalytic, go local, and keep innovating. Let's start with being catalytic. Traditionally, aid meant directly delivering the food, health care, or training that people needed. But at 2% of funding, we're never going to be able to reach everyone. 
The big money is in private and local government investment. We need to figure out how to engage them if we're going to reach massive scale. Let me give you an example of what that might look like. Erica Mackey was an American student living in Tanzania. She grew to love the country and wanted to find a way to improve people's lives. 85% of people in Tanzania live without electricity. And she realized the solution was right in front of her, the power of the sun. And so she started a new business called Off-Grid Electric to install home solar systems. There was one problem. How is she going to pay for all these? With grant funding, she might be able to buy a few hundred, maybe a few thousand, but that wasn't nearly enough. And then she remembered, three quarters of Tanzanians have a mobile phone. And a system of mobile money there means that with even the most basic feature phone, anyone can transfer money electronically in small amounts. So, Offgrid came up with a new business model using mobile money to enable families to pay off their home solar systems at just a few cents a day. I was in Tanzania earlier this year, and what's happening is remarkable. Offgrid is now providing electricity to over 100,000 homes, and they're aiming to reach a million by the end of next year. So how did they do this? They started out with a small $100,000 grant from USAID to test out this new business model. Based on their success, they received two more rounds of funding for a total of $6 million. Since then, because they were able to come up with a financially self-sustainable business model, they've been able to bring in almost $100 million in debt and equity. They've been able to reach exponentially more people by tapping into private funding rather than relying on grants. This, this is the difference between reaching thousands and reaching millions. Now, let's talk about going local. In the past, rich countries would decide what we thought poor countries needed and try to give it to them. But as we saw, people in low-income countries are becoming increasingly educated, tech-savvy, and urban. They're coming up with practical solutions to solve their own community's problems. They understand the challenges, what might work and what doesn't work, much better than we can. Take Sangha Moses. Sangha was an accountant working at a bank in Kampala. One day, he came home to visit his family, and he found his sister walking by the side of the road, carrying a huge bundle of firewood. She should have been in school. When she saw her brother, she started to cry. She'd been walking for six miles, and she wanted to be back in school. Sangha thought, there's got to be a better way. And there was. Sangha invented a new machine to take agricultural waste and turn it into fuel briquettes. These briquettes burn longer, cleaner, and are cheaper than wood. His company, EcoFuel, leases these machines to women and men in slums and villages. They make money, build up their business skills, and provide cleaner, cheaper fuel to their communities. And Sangha's sister gets to go back to school. Now, Sangha didn't stop there. With a grant from USAID, he's expanded his business. And today, EcoFuel is serving over 20,000 customers and Sangha's just getting started. Now imagine what might be possible if we were to invest in a thousand more local entrepreneurs like Sangha. Third, keep innovating. Traditional development programs seem safe. They come with a fixed budget, plan, and time frame, often planned for five years at a time, and they deliver predictable results for a fixed number of people. But we need to do more, and we need to do it faster. Remember this graph of mobile phone adoption? That's the kind of trajectory we should be shooting for. To do so, we should take a lesson out of Silicon Valley's book. Their venture capitalists invest for long-term growth potential and seek outsized returns. 
At the lab, our model looks a lot like VCs. We place lots of small bets and promising new ideas like off-grid and eco-fuel. And when they prove that their solution is much better than what's out there, we double down. We don't assume we can pick one right answer and just stick with it for years. Instead, we continually seek to improve existing solutions and find new ones that are even better. Off-grid and eco-fuel both started out small, but now they have the potential to reach millions. The face of global poverty has changed, and it's our responsibility to keep up. Look, we are not going to end global poverty with our limited funding sitting back in our comfortable homes and offices here in the U.S. The paradigm has shifted. We need to stop thinking about poor people and poor countries as beneficiaries and start thinking about them as innovators and partners who are stepping up to solve their own problems. Aid is not going to end global poverty, but global poverty is not going to end without aid. Rather than delivering aid, we need to drive innovation to find better solutions and bring in private and local government investments so that those solutions last beyond a grant and scale to the size of the need. We've reached a tipping point where ending global poverty is possible. Now, there's no excuse. We need to do it. Thank you. <laughs>